Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Chemistry 1030, chapter number nine, Chemical Reactions. I am Joseph Lamb, and I'm gonna be taking you through this lecture today. Uh, our real main focus today is understanding some factors that influence the rates of chemical reactions, and furthermore, understanding the concept of chemical equilibrium, and understand that when we react chemicals together, they don't always necessarily go to completion. That is, they don't always just go from all reactant to all product. In some reactions, we get lots of product, and in some reactions, we get very little product. And then what we'll do is we'll understand a little bit about Le Chatelier's principle, which helps us understand the direction in which certain stresses on a chemical reaction can impact the concept of chemical equilibrium. This will take us through uh, the rest of chapter number nine, and then hopefully we finish up with chapter number 10 very, very soon. So we're gonna take a look a little bit first at chemical kinetics, that is understanding the concept of collision theory, that is how there are certain requirements that must be met in order for a chemical reaction to take place. We're gonna define characteristics of endothermic and exothermic processes, that is energy absorbing processes and energy releasing processes. We're also gonna be listing four factors that influence the rate of a reaction and explain how they relate to concepts related to collision theory. We're also gonna define the term chemical equilibrium and know the conditions necessary to obtain an equilibrium state. We'll write out equilibrium constant expressions, calculate equilibrium constants, and then use Le Chatelier's principle to predict effect that concentration, temperature, and pressure changes will have on a system at equilibrium. So let's go ahead and dive in and get started. So in order for a chemical reaction to actually happen, several things actually have to occur in order for a chemical reaction to actually take place. The big picture idea of this is understanding the concept of collision theory. That is, there's a set of statements that give the necessary conditions in order for a chemical reaction to occur. And the reality is we need three things in order to take place. The first thing we need is molecular collisions. In order to convert reactant to product, molecules have to collide. It's a pretty straightforward concept. Without those collisions, we simply would not be able to convert reactant to product. The next is activation energy. The molecules have to have the ability, or have enough energy rather, uh, in the collision that they have in order to break the bonds, in order to convert between reactant and product. And then lastly, the collisions themselves have to have proper orientation. That is, they have to collide a certain way in order to be able to go from reactant to product. So as you can see in the example down here below, concentration is one of the factors that plays a role in regards to the rate of a chemical reaction. When you have a low concentration of molecules, you get very few collisions, and thus, very few of those molecules will be converted between reactant and product. However, the higher the concentration, the more collisions you end up having. More collisions means it's more likely that we are going to convert reactant into product, and as such, we end up having a higher rate of reaction. So let's talk a little bit about molecular collisions themselves. It's pretty obvious that two reactants have to collide in order to make or break bonds. Pretty straightforward. Without that collision, we simply cannot convert reactant into product. Most often reactions in the liquid or aqueous and gas phases tend to happen more often because it's more likely that the molecules are going to come in contact with each other. This has to do for a couple of different factors. Um, first off, the, the surface area of those molecules. Those molecules tend to be spread out very far apart, and so the surface area of liquids, aqueous solutions, and gases tends to be much larger than that of a solid. If you take a look at the solid example on the right-hand side here, you'll notice that only the molecules that are on the surface are going to be able to react with any material it comes in contact with. However, the liquid being uh, something that is uh, has more ability to move, more of those molecules can come in contact with other materials, thus resulting from reactant into product. This is something we end up seeing in lab where we notice that the ionic substances that are dissociated into water, because they're free moving, are much more likely to react than say covalent substances, which uh, tend to be bonded together and require more energy in order to react them. So part of the molecular collision aspect just simply has to do with the state of matter that they are in. Solids tend to react very slowly, whereas liquids, aqueous solutions, and gases tend to react in a much faster rate. Another factor that plays a role in this is activation energy. This is the minimum amount of kinetic energy that the reactant particles must have in order for a collision to result in a reaction. 
Slower reactions tend to require more activation energy. That is, reactions that are slower just simply need more energy in order to overcome the activation energy to go from reactant into product. Faster reactions do require less activation energy and thus result in a much faster reaction because they don't require nearly as much energy to convert between reactant and product. An example of a chemical reaction that is very slow that requires a lot of activation energy is rusting. When water comes in contact with iron, it will naturally rust. However, because the iron um, it has a high or the iron and the water need a high activation energy in order to convert to rust um, the reaction happens very very slowly and some reactions happen very fast you see quite a bit of these in lab when we react two chemicals together and they instantaneously get converted between reactant and product well that's because they don't require a lot of activation energy in order for that chemical reaction to take place Another factor plays a role here is collision orientation, and that has to do with the fact that the molecules need to collide with each other in a certain way in order to make the desired product. So if I take a look at the example on the right hand side here, we're trying to make carbon dioxide. And in order to get a proper orientation, the carbon dioxide or the carbon monoxide that is here has to collide with the NO2 in the proper way in order to produce not only the correct atoms of CO2 that's here, but also the correct structure. Notice that in CO2, the oxygen that is on the CO molecule here has to bond with the carbon. So in order for a proper collision to take place, the carbon of CO has to collide with the O of NO2 in order to produce the correct molecule. Notice here we have no reactions for these three because here, even though oxygen is colliding with the CO molecule, it's not in the proper orientation. The carbon would have to collide with this oxygen in order to produce an effective collision to produce a CO2 molecule. In addition to that, the oxygen of CO colliding with the nitrogen or even the carbon colliding with the nitrogen does not produce a correct collision because of the improper orientation. In order to produce a proper orientation, the CO has to collide with the oxygen in order to create the appropriate CO2 molecule. So undesired orientations do not result in a conversion between reactant and product. Now this is something that we do not necessarily have uh, control over. We can't control exactly how these molecules will collide. We can just change factors as in the amount of energy that's present in the molecules, the number of effective collisions, and those types of things. And then again, as previously discussed, the nature of reactants down below, ionic substances react much faster than covalent and molecular compounds because when ionic substances are dissolved in water or dissociated into aqueous ions, uh, they're free moving. And free moving ions will react much easier than those that are stuck within chemical bonds. Because the ions are free moving, there requires significantly less energy uh, to be able to convert between reactant and product. So as a result of that, we end up with a collision that is more likely to convert between reactant and product. So one of the ways that we characterize reactions is whether they are going to gain or they are going to lose energy as a result of a reaction. And reactions can either gain or lose energy over the course of a chemical reaction. An endothermic reaction absorbs energy as the reaction takes place and an exothermic reaction releases energy as the reaction takes place. And a lot of this has to do with the relative strength of the bonds that you are breaking and the relative strength of the bonds that you are trying to make. Um, we're not gonna get into too much detail about that, but what I would like you to be able to do and take a look at here is these diagrams that are here on the right-hand side. So if we take a look at the diagram here, and you notice that on your y-axis here you have energy and on the x-axis you have what is called reaction progress or sometimes this is labeled as time and notice the energy of the reactants is located at this point in the graph there is a certain amount of activation energy which we'll talk about in just a little bit that needs to be added but notice the difference between the energy of the reactants and the products here the products have much less energy than that of the reactants and what that tells me is that the amount of energy or the energy in this reaction is being lost, right? It is releasing energy because the energy goes down as a result of the reaction. We start from with high energy of reactants and we have very low energy of our products. So all of that energy going from here to here is being released and as a result, that is an exothermic process. So if you see a reaction energy diagram that looks like this, you know it's exothermic because the products are lower than that of the reactants. 
Now, if we take a look at the other graph here, our reactants start out very low, but our products end up very high. But what this tells me is that energy is being absorbed through the process of the reaction because my products have higher energy than that of our reactants. And so as a result of that, that ends up being an endothermic process. Energy is being absorbed, and so there's more energy in our products than there is that in our reactants. So it's pretty easy to take a look at these diagrams and indicate whether a reaction is exothermic or endothermic. We just simply need to take a look at whether energy is being absorbed or energy is being released. Or furthermore, we can take a look and recognize that our products are lower than our reactants, so energy is being released, it's exothermic. And here, our products have higher energy than our reactants, so energy is being absorbed, so the process is deemed endothermic. So we're going to go ahead and take a deeper look at some of these reaction energy profiles here to get a better understanding of determining how much energy is gained or lost and what is the activation energy. That is how much energy needs to be put in in order for the reaction to take place. Let's assume that the starting point for graph A here is going to be 40 kilojoules. Let's say the starting graph uh, point for B, same 40 kilojoules. And let's say the same for part C here is gonna be 60 kilojoules. Okay, uh, there's really a couple things I want us to be able to determine from each of these graphs. First off, I'd like you to be able to determine whether the graph is either endo or exothermic. What I'd like you to be able to do is to tell me the change in energy represented by delta E here. And to do that, we're just going to take the energy of our products and subtract from that the energy of our reactants. Okay, and then the last thing is the activation energy. And that is simply going to be the energy from the peak of the graph minus where the reactants start. Okay? So we'll walk through a couple of these together and hopefully you'll get a better idea of what we're trying to look at and what we're trying to solve for. So the first thing I wanna do for each of the four graphs is indicate whether the reaction is an endothermic or exothermic process. If I take a look at A, I notice that we are going from 40 and we are going up to 55. What that tells me is that graph A is going to gain energy. And gaining energy is an endothermic process. So I would say that this reaction here, reaction A, is an endothermic process. The energy of the products is higher than that of our reactants. Products being here and reactants being there. If I look at B, the products are lower than that of our reactants. So that tells us that this is losing energy, so this is an exothermic process. If I look at C, for part C here, same thing. Our reactants are at a higher energy than our products, so this is an exothermic process as well. And for here, for part D, our products are higher than that of our reactants. So that tells us that this is an endothermic process. So again, just looking at where the uh, reaction starts and where the reaction ends in terms of the energy simply tells you whether the reaction is endo or exothermic. If I want to know the change in energy, I just simply am going to take the energy of the products and subtract the energy of the reactants from that. So for example here, if I look at A, the energy of the products is 55 kilojoules. 55 kilojoules is where I'm going to start. And we're going to subtract from that the energy of the reactants, which is 40 kilojoules. And when we subtract those values, we end up with a total net gain of 15 kilojoules. Okay? I'm going to do the same thing for part B here. So again, we're going to take products minus reactants. I'm going to erase a little bit of this up here at the top. Hope you don't mind. It doesn't really matter because I'm doing it anyways. Actually, I should probably want to leave that peak minus reactants. Okay. So if I take a look at my graph here, we have 25 kilojoules of energy for our products and 40 for our reactants. So we're going to subtract that. We end up with a total of negative 15 kilojoules. And the sign of the kilojoules also helps tell you whether the reaction is endo or exothermic. If the sign is positive, it's an endothermic process. And if the sign is negative, it's an exothermic process. I'm going to look down here for C. Again, we start off with 20 kilojoules for our products. Remember, it's products minus reactants. And we're going to subtract 60 kilojoules from that. 
So products minus reactants, we end up with a total of negative 40 kilojoules, again, correlating that sign to the fact that our reaction is exothermic. And here we end up at 15 kilojoules and we are uh, at zero at the start. So 15 minus zero is 15 kilojoules. And again, positive value here because of the endothermic nature of the reaction, okay? So again, pretty straightforward. Just take the energy of your products, subtract the energy of your reactants, and you will get the total energy change of the reaction. Now what I'm gonna do next is we're gonna take a look at how we determine the activation energy. That is how much energy needs to be put into a reaction in order to get it to start. And notice the activation energy or AE that's listed here is the peak minus the reactants. The peak for the very first one is at 90 kilojoules and the reactants are at 40, so simply take 90 minus 40 and we get 50 kilojoules from that reaction. What that means is that this reaction requires 50 kilojoules in order to be converted between reactant and product. That requires 50 kilojoules to start the chemical reaction, okay? Without that 50 kilojoules at the very beginning, we cannot convert between reactant and product because we don't have enough energy to overcome the activation energy that is required of the reaction. In addition to that, let's take a look at the next reaction. It's gonna be very similar. We have 90 kilojoules at our peak, 40 kilojoules at our reactants. So 90 minus 40, that's gonna give us 50 kilojoules. Same thing, this energy, or sorry, this reaction requires 50 kilojoules of energy to be converted between reactant and product. If we look at the next reaction here, 85 is the peak of the graph, 60 is where the reactants start. So 85 minus 60, is 25 kilojoules, so positive 25 kilojoules for that. And then here, the peak is at 50, and the reactants are at zero, 50 minus zero is 50 kilojoules. So notice that all of the activation energies are positive, indicating that all chemical reactions require some energy in order to convert between reactant and product, all right? But again, hopefully you won't have too much difficulty going through and analyzing these graphs, or if I give you certain parameters, to be able to go through and draw out the graphs that are necessary in order to be able to complete this part of the lesson. All right, good deal. We'll move on here in just a moment. So one last quick little check for understanding here before we move on to a different topic. But what I'd like us to be able to do is to take a look at this graph here. I want us to A, classify the reaction as either endothermic or exothermic, B, determine how much energy is gained or lost in the reaction, and C, determine how much activation energy is needed to start the reaction. So before I begin, I wanna take a look at the energy of where my products, or sorry, reactants are, which are gonna be here, and the energy of our products, which are going to be here. So you notice we got a nice little line here, nice little curve that ends up uh, producing products from our reaction, okay? Um, in order to determine how much energy is gained or lost in the reaction, we're just simply going to look at the difference between where our reactants are and where our products are. So our reactants end up at this line here and our products are here. So if you notice in the graph here, it tells us the difference between those two lines is 50 kilojoules. So energy is gained, the reaction is endothermic, and 50 kilojoules is gained from the reaction. Again, if I wanna know the activation energy, it is simply the difference between the peak and the reactants. So notice that information is over here on the left. So this is going to require 150 kilojoules of energy that is needed for the reaction to take place, all right? So again, just make sure you have the opportunity to go through and analyze those reaction energy curves and diagrams. Take some time, look through some, practice with some, and go through and make sure that you can calculate how to go through and make these particular diagrams. All right, so the next thing we're gonna analyze tonight is we are going to take a look at reaction rate. And reaction rate is just simply the rate at which reactants are consumed and products are produced in a reaction in a given time period. So very similar to how we can agitate a chemical reaction, or sorry, rather uh, we can agitate a solution in order to make more uh, or, or speed up the process of the dissolution of the reaction, we can use some concepts in order to make the chemical reaction happen faster. And these are things that we are going to explore in lab when we get to our lab over the nature of chemical reactions. Uh, but if you take a look here, this chemical reaction is the process of rusting. Rusting is not a very fast process, which is indicative of it having a very high activation energy. It requires a lot of energy in order to be able to convert between iron, water, 
and uh, iron oxide, which is the chemical formula for rust. So the first thing I want to look at is physical states of the reactants. The first thing we want to take a look at is surface area. Generally, smaller particles will react faster, and this has to do with the greater surface area. Very similar to when we dissolve a substance, uh, greater surface area, things like crushed ice versus cubed ice. The crushed ice has a greater surface area, so therefore is going to melt faster, resulting in a faster rate of dissolving. Well, it's the same with chemical reactions. If I have a, a chunk of magnesium versus some powdered magnesium, the powdered magnesium will react faster because it has a higher surface area when compared to that of the chunked magnesium. So if I look at the diagram here on the right, the only molecules that have the ability to react with the molecules that are in the solution that are surrounding it are the ones that are on the outside. Reason being is that they're the only ones that have the ability to come into contact with any of the molecules to be able to convert between reactant and product. If we break up the magnesium, like what we've done here, well, the magnesium now has a greater surface area. And because it has a greater surface area, more of the molecules have the ability to collide with one another in order to be able to convert between reactant and product. So one thing I want you to consider is the physical state of the reactants and products in order to be able to convert between reactant and product and determine the rate of the reaction. If I look down here at the bottom, this down here is going to have a much faster rate of reaction in figure two than will be in figure one because the surface area of the molecules in figure two is greater, which results in more frequent collisions resulting in a conversion between reactant and product more frequently. So make sure when you're answering those questions that you correlate the, um, the concept with the ability to have effective collisions with one another. That's the whole goal here. Remember, it's all about collision theory. And if, when we're describing changes we're making in chemical reactions, we need to make sure that we tie it back to the fact that we have more effective collisions in figure two than figure one due to the fact that we have a greater surface area, more collisions, um, greater opportunity to convert between reactant and product. Next is the concentration. Uh, simply put, a larger concentration results in more frequent collisions and thus the faster rate of reaction. Again, make sure we correlate that to collision theory. So if I take a look in the very first example here, this very first example has very few molecules that have the ability to collide with one another. They'll still convert between reactant and product, but the process in which we are converting reactant and product is very low. On the right-hand side here, because we have higher concentrations, because we have higher concentrations, we have more molecules that have the ability to collide with one another, resulting in a greater opportunity to convert between reactant and product. So if we can see on the right hand side here, we have a greater concentration. Greater concentration results in more collisions, thus the rate of the reaction is greater. Again, remember we're tying all of this back to the rate at which a chemical reaction takes place and how that's correlated to how many collisions or effective collisions molecules have with one another. The next is reaction temperature. Uh, temperature is simply a measure of the kinetic energy of the molecules that are present uh, in the solution. The more speed causes more effective collisions. This allows more molecules to be able to overcome the amount of activation energy that is needed in order to be able to start the chemical reaction. The rate itself doubles roughly every 10 degrees for an increase in temperature. So if we're going from 20 to 30 degrees, we should see a double of an increase in temperature. Uh, 20 to 40 degrees, we would see a 100-fold increase in temperature. I want you to consider human body temperature and how important it is for us to be able to maintain homeostasis, that is the ability to maintain and regulate a stable internal environment. Simple changes in temperature, whether it be 10 degrees above or 10 degrees below normal body temperature, would either double or have the ability for the chemical reactions to take place inside of our body. So temperature plays a very important role in humans and their ability to now, live because they have to be able to convert between reactant and product efficiently. We don't want to you know, get our body's temperature too high, otherwise our cells won't be able to function, but too low, we can't uh, convert enough reactant to product and perform the chemical processes necessary in order for cells to be able to survive. So remember that temperature is a measure of kinetic energy. More energy in those collisions, they're more likely to overcome the activation energy and result in a more effective collision. Last one is a catalyst. And catalyst is a substance that increases the rate of a chemical reaction without being consumed. This is done by not adding in energy, but lowering the activation energy in the chart here for a chemical reaction to take place. 
Catalysts don't get used up in a reaction, which is why they're very efficient molecules because they continue to get reused over and over and over again. So they're very, very efficient in terms of their use. When drawing a reaction energy diagram, such as what I have here, and what I want you to notice is that this is an exothermic process. Yes, the products are lower than that of the reactants. But notice what happens to the hump or the activation energy when a catalyst is added. It is simply lowered. Where the reactants start does not change, nor does where the products end in regards to the reaction. The only thing that changes as a part of this is the fact that the activation energy is lowered. A lower activation energy results in a significantly faster chemical reaction. So if I were to ask you to draw a reaction energy diagram and then ask you to redraw the diagram but within the presence of a catalyst, the only thing you're going to change is the size of this hump here. That's all you're going to change is the size of the activation energy. Just make sure that it is lower than what it was previously and you're fine. Just don't change the reactants and don't change the product's energy. Only change the activation energy. All right, so just a quick little review in regards to things that impact rates of reaction. And um, you can take a look at that at your own leisure, but I think I've reviewed the previous content pretty well. Hopefully you're gonna be in good shape on that. Let's move on to our next topic. So we've previously made the assumption that all chemical reactions go to completion, and this is not the case, okay? There is a concept that is called chemical equilibrium, which refers to the fact that the forward rate and reverse rate of the reactions occur at the same time and at the same rate, okay? So let's consider what happens when you have H2 and I2 in an enclosed container and are allowed to react. We have the chemical reaction that is listed here, where H2 and I2 are going to form HI. When you start off the reaction, the rate of the forward reaction is very high. And the reason that the rate of the forward reaction is very high is because you have substantial amounts of reactants and very little product. What ends up happening over time is the rate of the forward reaction decreases and the rate of the reverse re reaction increases. Reverse reaction meaning going from product back to reactant. What we end up with is a point where equilibrium is established, where the rate of the reaction going forward is equal to the rate of the reaction going in the reverse direction. So rather than the reaction just going straight forward from reactants to products, we have a concept here where uh, we can have a reverse rate that is possible. All right. They like said it's a little bit complicated, but we'll dive a little more into it and see, uh, see what we can do with it. So again, take a look at the forward reaction here. So this is the chemical reaction going from reactant to product. We have H2 plus I2 yielding 2HI. Well, the reverse reaction is just simply going to be the reverse of that reaction. I don't know how else to describe it. We start with our product here and we end up with our reactant. But again, remember, we only have reactants to start. So the only thing that's in our container when we start this reaction is H2 and I2. So when we start this process, the rate of the forward reaction is very high because all we have are reactants to start. We have no product. As we convert to product, the rate of the reverse reaction increases. And what we happens here is we end up getting to a point where the forward rate and reverse rate are equal to one another, okay? So again, notice the rate of the reaction. The forward reaction is much greater than that of the reverse reaction when we start. This line up here is much greater than that of this line down here at the bottom. Well, what would cause that to be happen initially is due to the fact that we have more reactants at the very beginning of our reaction. Over time, as we develop more products, the rate of the reverse reaction begins to increase. And uh, what appears to happen to the rate of the forward reaction and reverse reaction over time, they become equal to one another. And eventually the forward rate is equal to the reverse rate of the reaction. Now this reaction is considered to be at equilibrium. Uh, notice the concentration, however, okay? When the concentrations do not have to be the same in order to be in equilibrium, okay? I wanna be very clear on that. Equilibrium does not mean equal concentration. It just simply means that the forward rate of the reaction is equal to that of the reverse rate of the reaction. So at equilibrium, you can have a lot of products and very little reactants, and you can have very little reactants and a whole lot of products at equilibrium. So the amount of products and reactants does not matter when equilibrium is established. What matters is that the rate of the forward rate, or sorry, the forward rate is equal to that of the reverse rate. So if that is the case, it is going to appear that no additional products are being formed, which is why this concentration here stays constant, and no more reactants are being formed or used, which is why this stays constant. 
okay? Now again, I, I, one thing that changes our reaction here is that sometimes, and I'll, and I'll go back to the previous slide, when we looked at our, our forward reaction versus our reverse reaction, uh, we ripped them separately here, and I don't wanna do that, okay? So what we do with the system at equilibrium is rather than write two separate reactions, we write them as one. So we combine them by utilizing a reversible arrow here. So notice the exact same chemical reaction, but what this tells me is that this reaction has the ability to go in the reverse direction like what we talked previously. That is the ability to go from products back into reactants. So when we reach what's called dynamic equilibrium, okay, that is when the forward rate is equal to the reverse rate. Dynamic equilibrium is reached when we reach at this point here in the graph where the forward rate is equal to the reverse rate. Notice when it's reached here, it's a little bit different. Uh, the concentrations of reactants and products are not necessarily equal to each other, but rather they just remain constant. And that is because the rate of the forward reaction is equal to that of the rate of the reverse reaction. So big thing I want you to understand is that dynamic equilibrium means that the rates going forward and reverse are equal to each other. Concentrations of reactant and product will not change once equilibrium has been reached. Equilibrium does not mean equal amounts of reactant or product, nor does it mean that the reaction is stopped. It's going to appear that the reaction is stopped because the amount of reactant and product produced does not change. However, the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction here. Okay, That's what I want you to understand about equilibrium is that the rates of the forward reaction are equal to the rate of the reverse reaction doesn't mean that they're the same amounts when equilibrium is reached. It just means that it does not change. Okay. So it is normal to write a reaction that can be reversed into a single equation utilizing a double arrow. And that's exactly what we've done here and what we did on the previous slide. This is considered a reversible reaction where one products have the ability to be converted back into reactants at the same time at which reactants are being converted into products. So by this being a reversible reaction, we can convert reactants to products, which is the forward reaction. But we also have the ability to go in the reverse direction and convert reactants back from products. It's all a reversible reaction means. So if you see the double arrow here, it just simply implies that, there's your, that your chemical reaction has the ability to go into the reverse direction. That's all it means. So if I were to take a look here and, and kind of analyze this graph in a very similar way that I looked at the previous graph, my reactant is N2O4, and the reason I know that is because it is the only thing present at the very beginning of the reaction graph that is here, okay? Notice that as the reactant gets consumed, more products end up being produced from the reaction. This system reaches equilibrium roughly at time D here, okay? It reaches at equilibrium here because the concentrations, notice it's on the graph here, the concentrations of NO2 and the concentration of N2O4 does not change. That is a hallmark for a system at equilibrium. A system at equilibrium is one where their concentrations do not change. All right, the rate of the forward and reverse reaction would be considered equal to each other at part D. But again, notice the concentrations of A or uh, N2O4 and NO2, uh, the concentrations are not the same. Equilibrium does not mean that we have equal concentrations. It just means that the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the reverse reaction, so NO2 and N2O4 will not change. Okay? So because the amounts of reactants and products do not change at equilibrium, this allows us to describe the extent of a reaction by calculating what is known as the equilibrium constant. So this is a very important equilibrium concept that I want to make sure that you know. This is a numerical ratio of products and reactants at equilibrium. A few things I want you to take into consideration as you go through and do this, okay? So this is a generalized equation. A plus B yields C and D, where little a, B, C, and D are exponents. The square brackets that are around A, B, C, and D are indicative of concentration of the solution. So you're gonna put brackets around every chemical that you take a look at when you go through and write the equilibrium expressions. Notice that products of the reaction are in the numerator here. So C and D are located on the top part of the fraction, whereas the reactants A and B are located in the bottom part of the fraction that are here. Coefficients become exponents. So notice that little a is now an exponent 
on the bracketed A here. Little b becomes an exponent on the bracketed b that is here. And then same with c on c and d on d. And keq, well, that is a term that is used to describe the equilibrium constant. It is a numerical value that helps us determine what the relative amounts of products and reactants are once equilibrium has been established. All right? So the first thing we're going to do with this is we're going to spend some time just writing equilibrium expressions, just practice writing these with a variety of different chemical reactions. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do some math associated with it. We're going to plug in some numbers and either be able to solve for K or be able to solve for one of the concentrations. So this is going to be pretty straightforward. So for example, in this equation here, I would either give you four of these concentrations and ask you to solve for KEQ or give you this value here and solve for three of these things and solve for, for the unknown, okay? So it's just gonna be a simple practice in math. So take a look at the equation that's listed here. 4NH3 plus 7O2 yields in equilibrium 4NO2 plus 6H2O. So notice what I've done here. I've taken my products and I've put them on top of my denominator. So NO2 is on top, H2O is on top. Notice how I've taken my coefficient and I've turned it into an exponent as well. So four becomes the exponent four on NO2 and six becomes the exponent on H2O. I've done the same thing for my reactants, but I've put them in my denominator. So NH3 will have an exponent of four, NO2 will have an exponent of seven. So uh, I, the big thing to remember, and I, I say this quite a lot with my other classes, is I say that products over reactants, coefficients become exponents. That's how you remember how to do this. It's products over reactants, right? NO2 and H2O on top, NH3 and O2 on the bottom, and coefficients become exponents. All of these coefficients here become the respective exponents next to the concentration of the chemicals that you're looking at. There's one last convention that we utilize when we do equilibrium constants, and it's that solid and liquid are never included in equilibrium expressions. So because solids and liquids have constant concentrations, we leave them out of equilibrium expressions. So notice the reaction that is happening here. We have H2O reacting with carbon, and it's in equilibrium with H2 and CO. But notice I did not include the carbon in my equilibrium expression here, and that is due to the fact, again, they're in constant concentrations. They do not change. So as a result, we do not include them in our equilibrium expressions. All right? Let's get some practice writing in some equilibrium expressions together here in just a moment. All right, so let's just get some practice writing the equilibrium expressions for the following. We'll do a couple more practices of these. We'll do some math with it, Le Chatelier's principle, and then we will be done. I don't, don't make videos this long, but um, you know, it's out of necessity more than anything else. So uh, equilibrium expressions for the following. So remember, it's gonna be products over reactants, and our coefficients are going to become exponents to here. So what I'm gonna write to start off with is K or KEQ, either are perfectly acceptable for me, equals product. So my product here is ICI, sorry, ICL. Notice that it has a coefficient of two. So I'm gonna put a two as an exponent. Over my reactants, my reactants here, I2 and Cl2. So not too difficult to go through and write those. Again, just you need to keep in mind, again, just say the mantra with me, products over reactants, coefficients become exponents, that type of thing. If you keep saying that mantra, you're gonna remember how this works, okay? Um, next one down here, one thing I want you to notice with this is we do have a solid. Remember, solids are never included in our equilibrium expressions. So we're gonna write this out the exact same way. Products over reactants, so H2, CO, and H2O on the bottom, okay? Now, I did blur out the uh, the right answers just because I wanted us to actually practice doing it. Um, I will erase these. Hopefully, I did these correctly. Oh, thank goodness. Otherwise, I would be losing my teaching career if I'd gone through and uh, gotten those wrong. Okay, but these are not that difficult to write. Again, products over reactants, coefficients become exponents. All right, I think I've got a few more practice problems here in just a moment. Let's take a look. Oh, goody, I do. Man, I always think of these things. I'm gonna have you guys do these on your own. 
I'll go ahead and write out some of these. Uh, I probably won't write out all of them, just depending upon, well, let's be honest, I'm probably gonna write out all of them anyways. Um, but uh, take your time, practice through these, okay? This is something that I really wanna make sure that you practice with so that way you get really, really good at it because these are really easy points to score on an exam, all right? So go ahead, write out those equilibrium expressions. I'll do it with you guys as you work through it. If you keep the video on, I will uh, write through it. I won't say much, because I, I tend to keep quiet, but. I say tend to keep quiet. I talk all the time. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that aqueous solutions are not considered liquids. So you would include anything that is aqueous. All done, all right? Notice a couple of things here. First off, I did not include any liquids or solids in my equilibrium expressions as I went through and wrote them, okay? This one down here, all you had was a product, so you really don't need to put that over one. I mean, you, you can if you wish, but it doesn't really do anything different. Um, and then remember that all of your coefficients end up becoming exponents as you write out your equilibrium expression for these, all right? So again, they're not that difficult to write, and I certainly don't want you missing easy points when you go through, take a look at an exam and find that, um, you know, you don't know how to write equilibrium expressions. Make sure you know how to do this. Two reasons. A, uh, obviously it's gonna be assessed, uh, and B, it's gonna be something that's gonna pop up a couple more times as we go through and continue working throughout the rest of the semester, all right? So now that we understand and know how to calculate equilibrium expressions or know how to write equilibrium expressions, we're just simply going to work on calculating the equilibrium constant. Now, this may seem like an arbitrary numerical value, but it actually has quite significant meaning in regards to determining whether we have more products or more reactants uh, when equilibrium has been established. So uh, in order to do this, we just simply place the numerical values of the concentrations into the equilibrium expression and solve for x. Uh, don't forget to take into consideration the values of the respective exponents. So if I look at the example here on the right hand side, um, basically the student has gone through and written out the equilibrium expression products over reactants and done so according to the chemical reaction. Notice that the student has plugged in the concentrations at equilibrium. Uh, just make sure that if it's squared, you actually square the numerical value. If it's cubed, make sure you cube the numerical value. Uh, and then just make sure you go through and solve and um, get the value for K. So here I would take 0.113 squared, put that number off to the side, take 0 0.602 times 0 0.420 cubed. So make sure you understand how to cube something. I can show you how to do that when we get back to uh, class here in a little bit. Um, but again, make sure you're going through and you're calculating that appropriately. All right, let's do a couple practice problems. All right, so what we're gonna do here, we're gonna go ahead and solve for this here. Uh, first thing we need to do is write the equilibrium expression for the following. So let's do that. So K or KEQ, products over reactants. Okay. Now it says using the concentrations below, calculate the equilibrium constant. So all we're going to do is we're just going to take these numbers, 
We're going to plug them in to our equilibrium expression, and we are going to go ahead and solve for the value for k. So CO is going to simply replace so 0 0.0046. Zero, H2O, same thing, 0 0.0046. Zero, all over H2, 0 0.0454. And 0 0.0954. Okay. Then we're just going to simply plug that into our calculator and we are going to calculate for k. So 0 0.0046 times 0 0.0046 divided by 0 0.0454 divided by 0 0.0954. What is an equilibrium value or equilibrium constant of 0 0.0049, okay? There are no units that are associated with the equilibrium constant either. So there's nothing you have to worry about there. Just go through, do the calculation, get the number, and you should be in pretty good shape, all right? Awesome, sounds good. Let's do the same thing for this reaction here. So write the equilibrium constant, so K products over reactants coefficients become exponents don't forget that part no all gases here so we're good it says using the concentrations below calculate the equilibrium constant so again we're just going to do the same thing here we're going to plug in and solve just don't forget that if you square the value in the equilibrium expression you're going to square the value um, as you mathematically calculate it so no2 is 0.0032 squared 0.0013 and then 0.0024 squared and that's all we do and now we just need to simply plug that into our calculator and solve so 0.0032 i'm going to square that value divided by 0.0013 over 0.0024 squared what i end up with two significant figures is 1400 Okay. Now those are two drastically different numbers, if you really think about it, right? We had a K value previously that was significantly less than one, and this one is much more than one. Uh, what do those numbers actually mean? Well, I'm actually just about to tell you. So the numerical value for K is very important. It tells us the relative ratio of reactants and products at equilibrium. Big thing I want to make sure that you know is that if the K value is greater than one, then that indicates that there are significantly more products when equilibrium is reached or when equilibrium is established. If K is less than one, then that indicates that there are significantly more reactants when equilibrium is established. So simply by looking at the numerical value for K, we can determine if we have more reactants or more products when we've reached chemical equilibrium. The magnitude of K also indicates the relative amount of reactants and products. So for example, let's say I had two values for K that are greater than one. Let's say I had one that was 5 and one that was 50. Well, the K value for 50 indicates that there was going to be more products at equilibrium than the K value that is 5 because that value for K, 50, is a greater magnitude than the value for K of 5. So I just want to make sure that you understand that the value for K tells us a lot about where equilibrium is established in regards to the relative amounts of reactants and products. So you can see here a very large value for K times 10 to the 30th, essentially all products, times 10 to the 10th, more products than reactants. Um, here you have significantly significant amounts of reactants and products, and then very small, we have much more reactants than products, and here we have essentially all reactants. So very, very useful tool. All right, last thing we're gonna take an opportunity to cover tonight, and just kind of wrap things up and get things finished, is the concept of Le Chatelier's principle, and equilibrium can be disturbed in a variety of different ways. This results in either the forward reaction speeding up or the reverse reaction speeding up in order to reestablish equilibrium. Essentially, we call these shifts, okay? And a system in equilibrium, which is disturbed, is going to generate either more reactants or more products in order to reestablish chemical equilibrium, okay? So when a system's in equilibrium, obviously the forward rate and reverse rate are the same. Well, we can do stuff 
to the system at equilibrium to cause it to not be in equilibrium anymore. And what ends up happening is that the system responds in a way in order to reestablish equilibrium by either shifting towards the left, creating more products, or sorry, creating more reactants, or shifting towards the right, creating more products. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at each of these shifts and try to get a better understanding of how chemical equilibrium changes when a system is disturbed, okay? So systems can be predicted, uh, or shifts in equilibrium rather, can be predicted when a system at equilibrium is stressed. Uh, we can either have one of a variety of different factors that plays a role in this. Uh, one of these is an addition of a chemical or the removal of a chemical. Another one would be a change in pressure or a change in temperature. So we're gonna look at each individual one of these to get a better understanding of how these particular changes causes shifts in equilibrium, okay? The addition of a reactant causes the system to respond by making more product in order to reestablish equilibrium, okay? So I, I, I don't know how to describe it. If you add in more product, the system's going to respond in order to, sorry. <laughs> when you add in more reactant, the system's going to respond to make more product in order to reestablish equilibrium. When you add more product, the system's going to respond to make more reactant in order to reestablish equilibrium. So kind of thinking like balancing. If I get more reactant, well, in order to make equilibrium occur, I've got to end up making more product as a result of that. When you add product to the system, the system responds by making more reactant. So by adding something, we end up causing the opposite thing to gain in order to reestablish equilibrium. Now, the opposite is true if we remove something. If we remove a reactant, the system is going to respond by making more of that reactant in order to reestablish equilibrium. And the opposite can be true if we remove a product. When we remove a product, the system is going to respond by making more product in order to reestablish equilibrium. So these are all pretty straightforward. We just have to think about whether we're adding or removing something and how the system's going to respond in order to reestablish equilibrium. So that's one, or actually that's two of the three ways in order to do this. Okay, if we're adding in pressure, okay, what we wanna take a look at is the side of the chemical reaction that has fewer moles of gas. So if we add pressure, it favors the side with fewer moles of gas. How do we know which side has fewer moles of gas? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pay attention to the coefficients of the equation. The coefficients of the balanced chemical equation tell us how many relative moles of gas are in each side. So for example, if I had one side that had two NO2, well, that tells us that that side has two moles of gas that are associated with it. Like I said, we'll spend a little more time going through and looking at these when we go through and do some practice problems, but I just wanna establish kind of a baseline here. And when we decrease the pressure, the reaction is going to shift to favor the side with more moles of gas, all right? So if we're looking at pressure, we need to look at the side of the chemical reaction that has either fewer moles of gas or more moles of gas, and then make sure we make adjustments accordingly. Okay, so increasing temperature favors products and an endothermic reaction and reactions uh, sorry, and reactants in an exothermic reaction, and decreasing temperature favors products in an endothermic reaction and products in an exothermic. This is a bit complicated, okay? I prefer to think of heat in regards to temperature. So here's how I would go through and do this, is the first thing I would do is to determine if the reaction is endothermic or exothermic, and that can be based off of a wide variety of different factors here. But essentially, you're going to go through the process and figure out, is the reaction endothermic or exothermic? And that can be based on the change in energy that's present. It may tell you that it's endo or exothermic. It may just put heat on one side or the other. You can, based off of information in the problem, determine whether the reaction is endo or exothermic. Then you treat heat like an amount. So if I were to increase the temperature, then the heat would go up. And if I were to decrease the temperature, then the heat would go down. And then we treat it like a reactant or product in regards to how we work to reestablish chemical equilibrium. All right? So like I said, I know I've thrown a lot at you in regards to Le Chatelier's principle. It's really one of those things that's best seen as we go through and maybe run some practice with it, which is exactly what we're going to do here in just a moment. All right, so what we're going to do here is we're going to utilize this balanced chemical equation here. And we are going to determine whether the changes 
uh, that we make to this are either going to shift equilibrium to the left, to the right, or potentially make no changes at all. So let's go through and take a look at this and analyze it. The first one says to add N2, O4. So what we're doing here is we're adding a product to our reaction. Well, in order to reestablish chemical equilibrium, the reaction is going to shift to the left in order to reestablish that. Okay. Next one here, remove NO. So NO is going to go down, we're removing a reactant. So in order to reestablish equilibrium, we're gonna shift left to make more reactant. So that's all I really wanna know. Am I gonna shift left, shift right? You can say more reactant, more product, either of those are perfectly acceptable. As long as you're in some way, shape or form indicating changes or chemical changes uh, in the reaction in order to reach equilibrium. Decrease in temperature. So notice that your delta H or your change in energy here is negative. Remember that a negative change in energy is an exothermic process, which means that it is releasing energy. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna consider heat to be a product. So in an exothermic reaction, heat's gonna be a product, and in an endothermic reaction, it's going to behave as a reactant. So as a result of this, heat is on our right-hand side, decrease in temperature, we treat heat just like a reactant or product. So as a result of this reaction, Heat is going to go down, so a product is decreasing. We shift to the right in order to reestablish equilibrium, okay? The one thing here that isn't included or something that we haven't really talked a whole lot about is this addition of N2. N2 is not in the reaction, so there is no shift, okay, or no changes when chemical equilibrium is established there, all right? Let's do one more set of practice problems. So by removing a product, we are going to shift equilibrium to the right in order to, well, reestablish chemical equilibrium. Uh, if we add in some CS2, so in this case now we are adding in, ah, we're adding in a product. When we add a product, we shift to make more reactant in order to reestablish equilibrium. Again, it's just a set of rules that we need to make sure that we go through and memorize and practice with. In addition to that, we're gonna increase the temperature. Now I've gone ahead and told you that heat is a reactant in this reaction. Um, in some instances, I might tell you that this is an endothermic process, so heat would go on the left side. I might tell you that the change in energy is positive. That would tell you that it is an endothermic process and heat goes on the left side. Uh, but again, we're gonna increase the temperature. We treat heat like a reactant or product. So when we increase the amount of reactant, we're gonna to shift to make more product as a result of that. And then lastly, it talks about a decrease in pressure. Remember that a decrease in pressure, decrease in pressure, favors the side with more moles. So this would be a good time to establish what I mean by more moles. Take a look at the coefficients of your balanced chemical equation here. So CH4 has a coefficient of one and H2S has a coefficient of two. So that tells us that we have three moles of gas on the left side and one plus four is five on the right side of my equation. So what that tells me is that it's going to favor the side with more moles, which favors uh, the side with five. So we're gonna shift right in order to reestablish equilibrium. So again, ladies and gentlemen, it is just all about practice and ensuring that you are in you know, just a, a good state to be able to understand how all of these shifts impact the concept of chemical equilibrium. They're, they're easy points per se, as long as you know the rules, but they can be easy to miss if you do not understand the fundamental rules and concepts related to Le Chatelier's principle. So just last couple things before we are done, there are a couple of things that we can add or change that do not cause a shift in chemical equilibrium. One of those is by the addition of a catalyst. A catalyst will speed up the rate of a chemical reaction, but will not have an impact on the equilibrium position. So if you do see a, the addition of a catalyst as part of this, then um, it does not have an impact on chemical equilibrium. In addition to that, it is the addition of an inert substance that is a substance that is considered non-reactive, one that does not play a role in uh, the chemical reaction itself. So if you see the addition of a chemical that is not part of the chemical reaction, then uh, it is not part of the 
uh, equation and we do not need to worry about its shift or impact on chemical equilibrium. So addition of an inert substance, one that's not part of the reaction, and addition of a catalyst, something you do not worry about in regards to equilibrium. Uh, that's all I've got for chapter number nine. I know it seems like it's been quite a quick. I did go through it a little bit quickly, but uh, I wanted to make sure to try to keep this as short as possible. I know I say as short as possible. It is uh, well over an hour, but um, I appreciate your time. Thank you for watching. And, um, you know, if you have any comments or anything, just make sure that you let me know. Have a great day, everybody, and we will see you soon.